Gettysburg is a great victory for the Union Army, and simultaneously, just as that very moment in early July, the uh, Union also captures um, Vicksburg out here. Vicksburg, a, a, that's another interesting place to visit. And by the way, they have four casinos in Vicksburg, if you're interested in that. Floating ones on the Mississippi River on riverboats. So they've gone way ahead of Gettysburg. But anyway, um, Vicksburg sort of commands the central Mississippi River. It's fortified city, high on the heights with cannons and everything. And um, it made it impossible for Union ships to go up and down the Mississippi because of the fortification. So capturing Vicksburg would open the whole Mississippi Valley to the penetration by the superior Union Navy. And that, of course, is what happens after a long siege by the Union Army under Ulysses S. Grant. Um, Vicksburg surrenders on July 4th, 1863, just a day after the end of the Battle of Gettysburg. Grant's um, siege of Vicksburg is a good example of the, what they call hard war. First of all, uh, first of all, he moves his army after trying to assault the city with no result. He actually moves his army around the city from north to south and besieges it. He manages to do that. How does he do that? How do you, the Vicksburg, is, it's all, uh, the swamps all over the place, very complicated. Slaves showed Grant a route to get his army around Vicksburg. It shows you the problem of the slaves being on the wrong side from the Confederacy's point of view. Their local information was very valuable to Grant in conducting the Vicksburg campaign. Secondly, going around to the south, he cuts himself off from his lines of supply. The supplies are coming down from Nashville. Now his army has to live off the land, which means they just go around taking things from farmers, right, and plantations. They just take food wherever they can get it. They gather it up. Um, and finally, he sends uh, Sherman, William T. Sherman, over to Jackson, very close by the um, capital of Mississippi at an important railroad junction just to destroy whatever he can in terms of property um, and, and the railroad. So you have this harder war being fought, the bombardment of civilians in, in Vicksburg, the living off the land, and eventually the, the large Confederate army surrenders in, uh, in Vicksburg. So these two victories changed the morale in the North considerably, at least for the rest of the year. Um, meanwhile, at the same time, the Republican Party and private organizations are mobilizing to generate pro-war support. The Union League, the Loyal League, these are private groups set up by well-to-do business types and others that flood the North with propaganda, with, with pamphlets, with leaflets, with newspapers talking about Confederate atrocities, talking about um, the importance of free labor to the nation and uh, democracy, et cetera, and castigating the critics of the war as traitors, right? That Vallandigham, that anybody who criticizes the war is a traitor, that the definition of loyalty is support for the Lincoln administration. If you criticize the war effort, if you criticize the policies, you are aiding the Confederacy. The cry of treason against the Democrats will be very potent in many parts of the North and will continue long after the Civil War. Long after the Civil War, the, you, the Republicans are the dominant party in the North because, among other things, of their ability to associate the Democratic Party with secession and, uh, and, and treason. Rumors about uh, grossly exaggerated of, of, um, of, of uh, saboteurs and secret societies aiding the Confederacy, the so-called Knights of the Golden Circle, the notion of pro-Southern agents scattered around, particularly in the Northwest, um, are, are circulating. And um, uh, all this leads to very large Republican victories in the fall elections of 1863. Vallandigham is defeated by the Republican candidate for Ohio governor by over 100,000 votes, a tremendous landslide, a severe blow to the peace movement in the Democratic Party. 
he won, uh, Bro, the Republican, won by a large enough margin. He didn't even need the votes of soldiers, but the soldier vote in Ohio, that is the, remember we said soldiers could vote in the field in the elections from their state, and then the ballots would be sent up. The soldier vote in Ohio in 1863 was like over 90% for the Republicans. In other words, the peace advocacy did not resonate at all uh, within the army itself. And in a, in a sense, what happens in 1863 is that the results of 1862 were reversed. Remember, 1862, the Democrats had made a major, major gains in the North. Now the Republicans win back a lot of these states that had gone to the Democrats. And um, uh, it's not only because of propaganda, not only because of the uh, of military victory, but also, I think, a growing acceptance and embrace of emancipation in the North as giving the war a moral purpose. The more there are casualties, the more there are, you know, the, the more the death roll keeps rising, the more people want to feel that there is some large purpose behind all this suffering. Preserving the nation is one, but now added to that is the destruction of slavery, and I think it becomes more and more widely embraced as the 1863 goes on and as black soldiers begin to pop up in the army, as we have said. But public morale is only as strong as, you know, the, the military success, ultimately. And um, in 1864, after these great victories of Gettysburg and uh, Vicksburg, nothing follows them up. Well, they do capture Chattanooga, over here in November 1863, the, uh, a major rail center in uh, Tennessee. But um, after that, um, nothing happens, or at least it seems like nothing happens. And in 1864, there is gr when Congress meets in December 1863, and then it's meeting through, eight, uh, through 1864, um, there's more and more um, more and more sentiment that Lincoln is not providing sufficient, sufficiently strong leadership. To us, Lincoln has been sort of deified by the end of the war, the assassination. It's hard to remember how much criticism there was of Lincoln during the war, not only by Democrats, but within the Republican Party. In February 1864, with a presidential election coming later that year, Lyman Trumbull, from Illinois, Lincoln State, writes uh, someone saying, you would be surprised in talking with public men here to find how few, when you get at their real sentiments, are for Mr. Lincoln's re-election. There is a distrust and fear that he is too undecided and too inefficient to put down the rebellion. The radical Republicans who have worked in this partly antagonistic, partly cooperative relationship with Lincoln, are not happy with Lincoln in early 1864. Uh, some of them just express a, what you might call gentle condescension. Congressman James A. Garfield, for example, uh, of Ohio, who later will become president and be assassinated, Garfield says in, um, in early 1864, I hope we are not compelled to push him for another four years. In other words, the radicals feel their role is pushing Lincoln, pushing Lincoln. Lincoln moves, but they say, why don't we have a guy we don't have to push? Let's have a real radical in as president. 